Hi, everyone. I'm a transplant hepatologist and clinician scientist at the Ajmera Transplant Center at the University Health Network. There are over 25,000 solid organ transplant recipients currently living across Canada. Life after transplant is made possible by the anti-rejection medications, which protect the organ against rejection. Short-term survival of liver transplant recipients has dramatically improved over the last three decades because of advances in anti-rejection regimens and hospital care. However, longer-term survival beyond a year has had limited improvement due to a higher risk of complications, complications like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cancer, such as recurrent liver cancer, that compromise the transplanted liver and long-term survival. Various risk factors, including anti-rejection medications, contribute to the increased risk of these conditions post-transplant. However, the underlying biological mechanisms of these post-transplant complications are not well understood. My precision medicine research program uses state-of-the-art technologies in molecular biology and bioinformatics to study the basis of post-transplant complications, looking at liver samples and animal studies. We've also been experimenting with AI, artificial intelligence. We used longitudinal data after transplant to develop deep learning-based algorithms that predict mortality secondary to the most common complications after liver transplantation. We have thereby developed a first-of-its-kind AI-based calculator to personalize care in the liver transplant clinic. This is a unique contribution of our group to the world of transplant, where the potential applications of AI are starting to become known. Transferring algorithms into clinical practice is a challenge right now, so I'm hoping that my research increases awareness of the power of AI among physicians. The ultimate goal of my research program is to generate personalized preventive and therapeutic strategies that allow our liver transplant recipients to live complication-free for longer and fulfill the potential of their transplant. I'm Mr. Amuchi. I'm a transplant nephrologist at the Ajmera Transplant Center at the University Health Network. I care for patients who have a kidney transplant and also for patients who are being assessed for a kidney transplant. I'm a clinician investigator and I oversee two research programs in my research group. We study equitable access to living donor kidney transplant. A living donor kidney transplant offers longer and better life uh, compared to staying on dialysis, but even compared to deceased donor uh, kidney transplant. We know that patients from racialized communities, that is African Caribbean or Black, East Asian or South Asian patients, have 50 uh, to 70 percent less chance to have a living donor kidney transplant compared to white patients. We have been working with community organizations from these communities, patients and healthcare professionals to understand the reasons behind these inequities. The initial results from focus groups, interviews, and questionnaires indicate that mistrust in the healthcare system, lack of representation in the healthcare, experiences with racism and discrimination, and a lack of reliable information and some misconceptions may be some of the reasons for various communities not to explore kidney transplant or living donation. Together with community organizations, we are co-developing resources and safe community-based clinical environments to support patients and their families to safely explore all their treatment options. Hello, my name is Anna Konvalenka. I'm a transplant nephrologist and clinician scientist at the University Health Network in Toronto. I care for patients with a kidney transplant, and my research program is entirely motivated by unmet clinical needs. One clinical need that my lab aims to address is how to make the kidney grafts live longer so that every patient would need only one kidney for life. There are three main causes of premature kidney graft loss, and they include antibody-mediated rejection, scarring or fibrosis, and ischemia reperfusion injury, which is the type of injury that kidney sustains at the time of transplant. And although my lab studies all three of these clinical problems, we're mainly focused on the study of antibody-mediated rejection. I have a PhD in basic science, and I address clinical problems by using molecular profiling, for example, proteomics, which is the study of all different proteins and how they interact, 
in the tissue of kidney, for example, from patients with uh, a kidney transplant and antibody mediated rejection, or in biological fluid like urine or blood. I also use systems biology, which is the study of how clinical characteristics of patients can be integrated with these molecular profiles in order to gain a better understanding of a complex disease such as antibody-mediated rejection. We recently published a manuscript that describes uh, a proteome of biopsies and different compartments within these clinically indicated biopsies from patients with antibody-mediated rejection or other forms of graft injury. And we're the, the first to describe early changes in the matrix of kidney with antibody-mediated rejection that had not been recognized before. We also identified two proteins that may play an important role in the disruption or remodeling of the matrix in antibody-mediated rejection, and we're studying their biology further. In addition, we're studying how kidney cells interact with immune cells by using sequencing of single cells in patients who have antibody-mediated rejection. We're also studying properties of circulating antibodies and how these properties may incite injury. And finally, we're focused on developing better models to study antibody-mediated rejection in a patient-specific context. To do this, we're working with two biomedical engineers in order to develop a kidney on a chip. Ultimately, the goal of my research program is to improve outcomes from, for patients through innovative and precision treatments that aim to prolong kidney allograft survival. I am a lung transplant surgeon and the surgical director of the Ajmera Transplant Center at the University Health Network. I care for adult and pediatric lung transplant patients and my research interests are directly related to improve access to transplantation and to improve outcomes of patients receiving new lungs. Our research program aims at developing strategies to significantly increase the number of lungs suitable for transplantation so that every patient will be able to receive the right organ at the right time. Over 80% of the potential donor lungs cannot be used for transplantation since they are too injured to be able to carry on a safe transplantation procedure. They have infections, they have inflammation, they have pulmonary edema or blood clots. In order to overcome this, we have uh, first developed a novel model uh, called ex vivo lung perfusion that is able to maintain donated lungs outside the body under physiological conditions for many hours so that treatment into this organ as a mini ICU to the organ can be performed. Some of the strategies that we're currently investigating includes the clearance of virus infections in donor lungs, such as uh, hepatitis C virus, cytomegalovirus, and Epstein-Barr virus clearance. We're also using specific enzymes to convert blood type A donor lungs to type O lungs, which could then be used in any blood type recipients. Finally, we're also developing strategies to preserve organs for days rather than hours, and to be able to use organs from donors that die of sudden cardiac arrest, which today cannot be used. Ultimately, our main goal is to generate enough donor organs so that everyone will have access to organ transplantation. Furthermore, with that, we'll be able to expand the indications of transplantation to a much larger number of medical conditions. Finally, these organs should be able to have a much longer durability in the recipient so that they can have a normal life again. Hello, and welcome to an evening of transplant innovation, part one of Ajmira Transplant Center's virtual open house. My name is Wendy Liang, and I will be moderating tonight's session. First of all, a big thank you to our panelists and our AV team for putting together the videos you just watched. Condensing complex research into a bite-sized piece of information is definitely not an easy task. So we very much appreciate that. It gave us a very succinct look at some of the topics we'll be discussing tonight. Before we get started, I want to share a little bit about my personal connection to transplant. I'm a health reporter with the Globe and Mail. 
And a few years ago, while reporting on organ transplant rates in Canada, I was struck by the fact that the number of living organ transplants had remained stubbornly flat and had not increased in many years. It made me wonder what, I, what, what could be done to improve living donor rates, and there was no better place to start than myself. So two years ago, I donated one of my kidneys as an undirected donor. And like everyone else here tonight, I'm wishing for the best possible health for people waiting for organs and those who have received them, including the recipient of my kidney, whoever and wherever they may be. So now that you know a little bit about me, uh, let's introduce you to tonight's speakers. We'll start with Dr. Mamatha Bhatt, um, the staff hepatologist. Dr. Bhatt, how long have you been with the Ashmere Transplant Center and what attracted you to transplant? Well, I've been with the Edgemira Transplant Program uh, for over five years now, uh, Wensi. Uh, and um, you know, in terms of my attraction to transplant, I would say that it started during my uh, medical residency when I had a patient who uh, on my ward uh, ultimately underwent a transplant. And I saw the miraculous transformation from uh, end-stage liver disease to um, you know, wonderful quality of life after transplant. So, and I was also inspired by my mentors uh, during that time who were transplant hepatologists who just seemed to be so, um, uh, so much uh, in love with hepatology and with liver transplantation and the impact that it could have on patients' lives. So I was really enamored by um, transplant starting from those days. And uh, that's really what set me on the trajectory uh, that has led me here. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Mucci. Thank you for having me as well today. I mean, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be uh, a part of this wonderful evening. So I should, uh, I should start, I should have started with that, but thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, Dr. Mucci, let's go to you next. How long have you been with the Ashmera Transplant Center and what got you into transplant? Thank you very much uh, for having me and for the question. Uh, I have been uh, uh, with the Ajmer uh, Transplant Center since 2014. I'm Hungarian. I trained in Hungary. Uh, then I came to Toronto for a nephrology fellowship. And then I moved uh, all over the place, eventually landing in Montreal, where I, I started my transplant nephrology career. And then in 2014, I moved to Toronto. Uh, my first encounter with, with transplantation was back in Hungary where we started to uh, do research uh, uh, about quality of life of patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease uh, on dialysis. And we did a comparative study between patients who were on dialysis as opposed to transplant. And that was kind of the first step uh, into the direction of transplant that eventually led to my position at UHM. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, Dr. Sipiel, you next. Uh, can you tell us about your background and, and why you got into lung transplant? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks uh, for the invitation for being here. It's uh, really great. Um, when I was a medical student uh, in my uh, uh, one of my last years, uh, I came to visit uh, uh, the thoracic surgery division at uh, UHN. I was originally doing my medical school in Brazil. Um, and uh, when I got here, um, I uh, went to watch a, a lung transplantation at that time. And I was very impressed, you know, by seeing the, the life transforming uh, procedure that that was when I saw a patient coming uh, to, the, to the operative room, almost suffocating without air. Um, and, uh, you know, after that operation, and especially seeing the new lung expanding in the chest was uh, something very impressive for me at that time. Um, and then I got to know that uh, actually Toronto was, uh, you know, the mecca of lung transplantation at that time. That was the, the place where uh, the first successful lung transplant was performed uh, in 1983. And, um, and I started uh, getting very uh, interested in that field. And um, eventually uh, I returned to Toronto for a formal training in this area and, and that ended up staying here. Wonderful, thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Dr. Um, how Dr. Kamvalinka, how long have you been with Ajmer Transplant Center? And can you tell us about how you got into transplant? 
Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the questions. I've been with the uh, Jamira Transplant Center since 2015. Uh, and um, I was really inspired from a clinical perspective by transplantation because although there are other treatments for end-stage kidney disease, this is really the best treatment. And this is one of those moments in medicine when patients walk away happy from the hospital after they receive the, a new kidney transplant. Um, other reasons are that from a biological perspective, it's the most interesting solution of all the solutions for end-stage kidney disease because we have to overcome this uh, immunological barrier. So it's very interesting to study. And, uh, and I was like Mamata inspired by uh, giants and mentors in uh, transplantation. I, I had the fortune of working with uh, Gary Levy and Lori West uh, um, as a summer student <laughs> many times in their labs. And so that work really sort of um, inspired me to pursue a career in transplantation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us and for giving us some insight as to why you chose a career in transplant. Um, so let's get started. Uh, a question we really want to address tonight is why transplant, transplant innovation is important for patients and professionals. Um, and I think the best way to answer that question is to look at some of the challenges that transplant faces. So despite the incredible progress in the field of transplant over the last several decades, there are still obstacles to overcome. And one of these challenges is the fact that there are not enough suitable organs to meet the needs of the, the people who are waiting on, on transplant wait lists. Um, Dr. Sipiel, uh, you've been involved in something called ex vivo lung perfusion. Can you explain what that is and how it addresses the shortage of viable lungs for transplant? Sure. Um... So uh, one of the important factors, uh, you know, in the shortage of organs, it's not only that there are not enough donors, but um, uh, we don't use many organs from the currently uh, available donors. And just to give an example, uh, in lung transplantation, typically 80% of the uh, donor lungs are discarded and not used for transplantation. And, uh, you know, the main, main reason for that is uh, because, um, you know, when a potential donor uh, is in the ICU, um, they uh, develop some uh, lung injuries. Uh, the lung is a very frail organ uh, in that regard. Um, and uh, they can get uh, some what we call pulmonary edema or water inside the lungs. They can get infections. They get inflammation because they are on a ventilator, on, you know, on artificial breathing machines, um, and this ends up causing injury to the organ. And um, so, the the typical way that we preserve uh, lungs uh, uh, or any organ, you know, uh, has been just to putting the organ on ice cooler and and preserving there and bringing to the hospital. And while that is actually quite helpful to prolong the life of the organ once is removed from a donor, um, it shuts down the metabolism of the organ in a way that you can't really um, make improvements to the organ uh, during the preservation time. And so if you have this 80% of the organs which are already not viable and you just put them on ice, you're not going to do any good for them and, and you won't make them transplantable. And that's the, the rationale for preserving the organ in a more physiological state, uh, uh, which we call the, the ex vivo lung perfusion or ex vivo organ perfusion for that matter, as this has been developed uh, for all organs. And uh, we started working on this uh, in 2005 when you know, I arrived in the lab here as a master's student and uh, Dr. Kishabji was my supervisor at that time. Um, and um, uh, he had uh, this concept uh, of trying to develop this system uh, for some gene modification of the organ uh, where you would need some you know, active metabolism going on. And, uh, and, you know, and then we met and uh, uh, start developing that concept um, in which today we have already used in, in over 700 patients uh, in our institution and had a, a major role in increasing um, uh, the amount of organ transplantation. Right. Uh, sorry. So, so instead of um, instead of keeping the organ on ice, um, what what does it kind of look like? 
Yeah, so it's like you're keeping the organ uh, in a mini organ ICU, let's be put in this way. So you pump some fluid uh, through the organ, uh, which is, it could be a bloodless fluid or, or a blood uh, compound solution, depending on the type of organ. The, the lung is unique that doesn't need uh, actually oxygen cohers like hemoglobin, but uh, like a liver or the heart will need that. Um, and um, um, you keep the organ functioning, you know, ventilating uh, the organ and you keep at 37 degrees uh, so that uh, the metabolism of the organ is uh, functioning. So you can not only assess uh, how the organ is functioning at that time, um, so we can be used just as an organ assessment tool, but also you can add some treatments during that time and reassess the function. Um, so that's uh, pretty much uh, what uh, the, it's a platform basically to um, order active treatments and, and use the organ um, active metabolism as a way to allow that. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kovilinka, you are director of the transplant biobank for kidney, pancreas and liver transplant programs. Can you tell us what is the purpose of the biobank and, and how will it lead to innovations in transplant? Sorry, it's my phone ringing. <laughs> Thank okay. you for that question. Um, so uh, biobanks are, what is a biobank first? The biobank is a place where we store not money, but tissue and fluid samples that come directly from patients, patients who have consented to donate them. And uh, we collect them as part of a routine clinical care. Uh, these in general, in terms of innovation in research and in terms of scientific progress, uh, we have gone very far when studying animal models of disease or um, transformed cell lines that we can purchase from a company and so on. But it has only taken us so far. And we are trying to transition that research to um, uh, to enhance the innovation and new discoveries by studying patient-specific samples. And I think that that really will in, enable us to see, for example, what is happening in the kidney of this particular patient, or how can we monitor this patient, this, this patient and discover a certain disease uh, uh, early, or what type of medication might they respond to? So, so first, it is a way of... Um, being able to study disease in a patient-specific context. Next, uh, this, these types of samples and the analysis that we can do on them, we can also integrate with clinical and other laboratory um, data that we have and that we collect routinely as part of clinical care. And that can enable us, that can give us a lot more power to derive new hypotheses about uh, how certain diseases evolve and develop. And finally, and what I hope in the future we'll be able to do is to utilize some of these samples and, for example, either cells isolated from blood or cells isolated from the kidney tissue of patients in order to test uh, new drugs um, on a dish and then uh, derive hypotheses about what might work for the patient and what we might want to try in the future for the patient. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, Another obstacle that we've that has received quite a lot of attention recently due to, due to the pandemic is the issue of health equity. And the road to transplant isn't an easy one. The process patients have to go through to get on the list is lengthy and time consuming. And patients who want to be considered for transplant are quite sick. Um, Dr. Mucci, the pandemic has exacerbated and laid bare certain health equity issues that have been around for decades, particularly for African, Caribbean and Black Canadians. Um, what does your research show in terms of access to live donor kidney transplantation for these same populations? Uh, well, uh, that's true that uh, the pandemic uh, was just another uh, unveiling of existing inequities in healthcare. And uh, certainly this um, clearly uh, has affected uh, uh, communities like the uh, African Caribbean Black community, but also um, it has disproportionately affected some of the South Asian uh, communities in Ontario specifically, and of course, uh, indigenous communities throughout the country. Uh, when it comes to access to transplant and utilization of kidney transplant 
or living donor kidney transplant, there are, from a medical perspective, the best treatments for kidney failure. This has been known uh, for, for many years in Canada as well, that access to these treatment forms are not equitable and certain communities, specifically uh, patients who come from black or, or Asian or indigenous communities, uh, they have much less chance to, to receive a living donor transplant compared to uh, white uh, counterparts. And our research uh, has been focusing for the last four or five years, has been focusing on these issues in multiple communities, uh, more recently and more actively on the uh, African Caribbean black communities. And what we see is that patients from coming to these communities have a 50 to 70% uh, less chance to receive a living donor kidney transplant compared to, to white patients. And this is not unique to kidneys. Uh, this is probably similar to liver transplants where living donation exists. Also, we know that uh, donation, willingness to donate uh, or the readiness to donate uh, in, in some of these communities is much less compared to the uh, white uh, uh, populations. And even uh, access to bone marrow uh, transplant is, is uh, much reduced for uh, people from racialized communities um, due to a various cultural societal uh, reasons, but uh, not, not uh, uh, negligibly uh, due to experiences of systemic racism in these communities and the lack of trust uh, in the institution of the society in general, but also healthcare in institutions. Right, okay. That 50 to 70%, that is a staggering rate, uh, a, a staggering difference. Um, let me just turn to Dr. Bat for a moment. Um, Dr. Bat, you, you recently published research that investigated sex-based disparities um, in access to liver transplant. Can you tell us a bit about that research and where, where that's headed? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. So um, the MEL sodium score is what we use to prioritize patients on the waiting list for liver transplantation. And uh, although that particular scoring system has dramatically decreased overall mortality on the waiting list. So it's done a really good job of overall mortality decrease on the wait list and increased access to transplant overall. Over the years, we've realized that women are compromised in terms of their access to transplant due to a few different factors. So there's a complex uh, range of factors that are resulting in sex-based disparities in access to liver transplantation. One major issue is uh, the creatinine, which is an index of uh, kidney function, uh, which is disturbed in advanced liver disease or uh, end stage liver disease. And so that is um, uh, significantly less in women as compared to men um, due to lower muscle mass. Additionally, the sodium, which is another parameter on the MEL sodium score, also underrepresents the degree of severity of liver disease. So we know that even following the uh, implementation of the MEL sodium score, we see these significant disparities in access to transplant and mortality on the waiting list of women. Now, the research we did was to examine whether we as a program that offers living donor liver transplantation do a better job in allowing for more equity on the waiting list. So um, what we found was that by virtue of giving access to living donation, there is uh, relatively equalized access to transplant overall. So in terms of mortality and access to transplant, there is uh, this uh, equalization of disparity. And so we do a very good job of giving access to living donation, through giving access to living donation, uh, we're able to offer decreased mortality to all people. So all people have the advantage of having access to liver transplantation earlier before they become too sick for a transplant. But we re also realize that in terms of the equity aspect that women are able to um, therefore have uh, rectified um, uh, equal access to transplant overall on the waiting list. Right, that sounds quite and helpful. In of, and in terms of where we're headed, I think what we're interested in doing overall, because this isn't, it's not just living donation being offered. I think we have to 
like really examine how we can improve the overall organ allocation system, because I think, uh, and this is a widespread problem, uh, obviously in North America, in the US, as well as in Canada, this is a significant problem uh, throughout the world. Uh, actually, the, the fact that the melsodium is still in place and does not adequately reflect severity of liver disease in various subgroups, including women. So I think we really have to look into solutions and we are actually looking at um, trying to uh, rectify this issue by developing more um, uh, tools, uh, a more um, a uh, valid score that represents mortality on the waiting list. And uh, one of the tools that we are using is actually uh, machine learning uh, based methodologies to assess whether we can account for longitudinal changes in blood tests over time, as well as the clinical parameters to better reflect that dynamic state on the waiting list and uh, prediction of mortality. Great, okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Sipiel, you recently performed a double lung transplant on a patient whose lungs were irreparably damaged by COVID-19. What impact do you foresee COVID having on the need for a lung transplant? Um, and are, are you working on any innovations that can kind of pro improve access to care for these patients? I think that's an excellent uh, question. Um, this is a very rapidly evolving field. Uh, uh, in fact, we have already transplanted four patients uh, uh, here at UAGEN with uh, lung uh, damage uh, by COVID. And, um, you know, we, we are seeing uh, uh, more patients in these latest waves uh, that may be candidates, especially because uh, we're seeing younger, younger patients with uh, a lung injury that does not recover. It's a, it's a little bit early to tell what will be the overall impact going forward uh, in the future. Uh, you know, the patients we're considering for transplant right now are the ones which are in the ICU, with, which can't win from a ventilator or an artificial lung machine. Um, however, um, you know, certainly there will be a portion of patients that left hospital, but they do they have develop chronic lung disease related to COVID and they will need transplant in the future. We don't know yet what is, you know, the magnitude of that uh, population. You know, um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a difficult decision when we have to consider one of these patients for transplantation. There are a lot of ethical uh, issues which are at discussion as well. And, you know, how do you select a specific pa patient that became acutely ill versus someone that has been waiting for an organ for, you know, several months uh, already uh, on the wait list. Unfortunately, even with the ex vivo lung perfusion, we still don't have enough lungs for everyone that we would like to transplant. So all these considerations have to be put uh, in place and some ethical frameworks are, are being uh, worked up uh, as well. In terms of uh, where are we going on this, I, I think the legacy of COVID related lung disease uh, will stay in terms of um, evaluating when a transplant should be performed in someone with an acute lung uh, injury. Um, and in the past, we also had patients with, uh, for example, influenza, lung disease that would stay in the ICU for several weeks or months and we never considered transplantation uh, in that setting pretty much. And I think now we'll, we'll start considering um, as well. But I think more importantly is um, we still don't have the special markers that tell us whether that lung will never recover. And um, you know it's better for the patient if they can recover without the transplantation and keep their own lungs. And we sometimes we see very dramatic improvements in the lung that you would say, well, this lung will never recover. And you just wait another six weeks, eight weeks, and you see you know, a very huge uh, change uh, on that. And, and we still don't have those markers that tell us for sure, you know, this lung will never recover and therefore this patient should be transplanted. And we're working on some research to try to identify those markers which is not only radiological appearance of the organ, but some molecular assessment of the cells that you can assess in the organ, you know, via the bronchoscopy procedures, for example. 
Great, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we know that at, at, at present, transplant is a treatment and it's not a cure. So let's talk about improving quality of life and long-term outcomes of transplant. Um, Dr. Kompolinka, your research focuses on antibody-mediated rejection and kidney allofibrosis. Can you explain what you were learning about these complications and what your hope is for kidney patients? Thank you for the question. Um, so antibody-mediated rejection and fibrosis are two of the most important reasons why kidneys are lost prematurely before their time and why patients then have to either return to dialysis or seek another transplant. So uh, there's a lot of interest in trying to solve them and, and derive better treatments for these, these two entities. Uh, of course, part of the problem with lack of treatment is that we don't really fully understand the disease at the level of the tissue, what actually happens in the kidney. And so my lab, for example, decided to examine um, these molecular profiles uh, within the kidney, within very small compartments that were sampled already at the time of this clinically indicated biopsy. And so we studied um, this antibody-mediated rejection and compared it to other uh, forms of graft injury. And uh, we determined several things. First of all, these were very early cases, and we found that the matrix, which is the structure that the cells sit on, uh, was disrupted even at that very early stage, and even though the pathologist was not able to tell us that when looking under the microscope. So before these changes were really visible, we were able at a molecular level to find them. And we were able to find that in different compartments within the kidney, we found sort of different uh, proteins. These are molecular actors that perform certain functions uh, that were disrupted. And that way we think may play a, a key role in uh, altering this matrix and sort of perpetuating injury. And this matrix is important because it is altered in chronic and late antibody mediated rejection. There are currently no effective treatments to reverse it. So from that perspective, our goal is we're now studying how these different proteins, these molecular actors, what do they do in this context? And we have a goal to ultimately either inhibit them or to add more of them to see if that ameliorates injury. Uh, we are looking at and finding out which exact immune cells um, are, are altered in the context of antibody-mediated rejection by looking at single cells and their sequencing. So all the gene profiles within each cell within the kidney from a biopsy of a patient with antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, and uh, when talking about fibrosis or scarring in the kidney, um, my lab has discovered a certain group of proteins, again, which we can measure in urine. Um, and which seem to correlate with the degree of scarring that develops in the kidney. And so our hope is to use these proteins, for example, to uh, monitor in a non-invasive way how uh, scarring progresses um, to in the future, if they're truly proved to be informative markers of injury, to incorporate them into future studies of therapies um, as sort of surrogate markers of injury. And we're also starting new studies where we're trying to see uh, whether uh, by uh, altering them or inhibiting them as a group, we can uh, affect fibrosis or diminish or arrest progression of fibrosis. Right, okay. So, so a simple urine test might be able to detect how well somebody's kidneys are doing then. Well, we currently have fantastic blood tests like creatinine that uh, it can tell us uh, you know, certain function of the kidney, but we don't have good non-invasive markers of the scarring within the kidney. Mm -hmm. so, so this would be uh, sort of a marker of scarring the kidney. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Bhatt, your, your research looks at long-term complications in liver transplant patients. Um, what are some of the so some of the complications that you see, and and what could your research, um, if it's successful, mean for for liver transplant patients? 
Well, so thanks for the question, Wincy. So what we've seen is that short-term survival, one-year survival has dramatically improved in liver transplant recipients over the last three decades. However, if we look at long-term survival beyond a year, we see that that has not significantly improved in the last three decades. And that's because liver transplant recipients, and this is true for other solid organ transplant recipients, have various complications, including a higher risk, up to three times higher risk of cardiovascular disease or heart disease. They have a much higher risk of cancer of various kinds, and they have a higher risk of infection. Additionally, uh, the graft can accumulate scar tissue, again, without us really realizing it can accumulate scar tissue over time. So the reason for this, we think that there are various reasons that likely account for this uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Part of it is the immunosuppression. So certainly that immunosuppression, the anti-rejection medications, although they are protecting the liver against rejection, they also do increase the risk of metabolic disease, meaning diabetes and cholesterol and hypertension, thereby increasing cardiac events. Additionally, being on anti-rejection medications decreases the cancer sensing mechanism of the immune system. And therefore any cancer that arises tends to be biologically more aggressive. And so there has been say epidemiologic literature generated in the liver transplant setting, but there's been very limited mechanistic studies done in this area. So really profiling patient samples and really trying to understand the molecular basis of, uh, for example, fatty liver disease uh, recurrence, which is, um, you know, recurrent in 70% of patients who are transplanted for NASH for fatty liver disease, and also in uh, patients not transplanted for fatty liver disease, we're seeing up to 70% having mm -hmm. fat accumulation in their liver. So, and we realize that now that's uh, a very important and leading, it's become a leading indication for transplant. So my lab is interested uh, in that particular topic, investigating uh, fatty liver disease recurrence in the graft and seeing how we could uh, improve treatment and make it more precise mm -hmm. and targeted. Because right now, the way we're treating patients is really based on what is known from the non-transplant literature. So we're basically transplanting that evidence into the liver transplant setting and treating patients. So we're not really, we're doing a uh, practice based on more observational studies and retrospective studies, but not really trying to understand the mechanistic basis. So that's one theme that my lab is very interested in understanding. Another one is recurrent liver cancer. So liver cancer has become a dominant indication for liver transplant. 35% of patients are being transplanted for liver cancer. And there is a 15 to 20% recurrence rate. And when it recurs, again, it tends to be biologically very aggressive. And so again, what we're interested in understanding is why that is, what are the mechanisms for that very aggressive disease and what we could do to better treat patients and prevent, first of all, prevent and then treat and in fact, we've generated um, uh, data recently uh, with a collaborator with expertise in methylation or epigenetics. And uh, we've identified certain proteins that are allowing for immune escape, meaning they're allowing for escape from the immune system of these cancers, allowing them to be more biologically aggressive. So that will serve as potential uh, you know, targets, those will potentially serve as targets for both prevention and therapy. Um, and then uh, another important theme within my program that I think uh, will also help improve long-term outcomes um, is uh, the development of more precise preventive and therapeutic strategies uh, based on large data sets. So we uh, recently published uh, an article uh, based on the uh, U.S. Uh, experience of liver transplant recipients, and we determined predictors of mortality post-liver uh, transplant. We uh, developed machine learning algorithms to predict uh, a one-year and five-year outlook uh, for survival. Um, 
at each serial clinic visit after transplant. And uh, we did this for the four major types of complications and then ultimately derived a list of predictors that could then be um, assessed by the liver transplant physician to then modify care. And we're really working towards developing this as a web app, fine tuning this algorithm. And uh, ultimately our idea is to implement this in clinical practice to improve long-term outcomes, meaning long-term survival after transplant. Right. And, and sorry, when you mentioned the, the idea of being able to modify care, are, are, are there ways that, 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 that care can be modified at, at the moment? Well, at the moment, so uh, a lot of what we're doing in the clinic, again, is informed by uh, retrospective studies or, um, you know, observational studies. And then again, bringing care from the non-transplant world into the transplant world. Uh, additionally, a lot of it is our experience as hepatologists. So we see so many patients, um, you know, our program um, performs a large number of liver transplants and uh, we see so many patients and really our experience informs a lot of our practice. So based on previous patterns, we then you know, develop treatment strategies. And uh, as a group, we will follow certain strategies for a particular pattern or a certain uh, diagnosis. But I would say that, you know, there's variability in the management, even within the center, as well as across centers. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to work towards uh, being a bit more precise in our management uh, and personalize our management to the specific patient. Um, so doing this in a more objective fashion, I think would result in more optimal long-term outcomes. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Mucci, one of your streams of research focuses on patient reported outcomes or PROMs. What are PROMs and, and why are they important? Well, I guess, uh, thank you for the question. It, it, is, um, it is an interesting aspect. We're talking about innovation here. But when we're talking about innovation, frequently we need to go back to the basics, uh, to, to the foundations, to, to old things. And when, when it comes to medicine, um, uh, one important thing uh, that has been uh, a cornerstone is human relations and uh, the um, interaction and the, the human encounter between a physician and a patient. Um, and this is, uh, by the way, uh, quite uh, true, this, this approach of looking for back to, to the old ways of doing, when we talk about the uh, equitable access issue is that, that um, uh, in addition to, to understand the, the, the societal uh, the difficulties that uh, communities have, uh, just going back to the basics of uh, engaging communities, building capacity in the communities itself and, uh, enabling people and, and communities to look, look uh, after the issues that, that are there together with the support of, uh, of uh, people who have been doing the research or building these tools, uh, hopefully will uh, bring uh, innovation and uh, improve the results to equity, but also to the broader issues of quality of life and success of treatment. And when you asked about PROMS, uh, basically, PROMs or patient reported outcome measures are simply put questionnaires, uh, but more in a more complex way understood complex measurement tools to assess certain aspects of health and uh, illness experience patients have. Uh, uh, this basically started main, mainly uh, looking at quality of life about 30, 35 years ago when people uh, developed these uh, at that point, fairly simple questions and questionnaires to ask people what they, how they felt and how much pain they had, how much fatigue they had, how much anxiety or stress or depression was associated with their current situation with that chronic illness. Over the, the last uh, several decades, uh, different uh, research uh, groups developed new ways of of using these questionnaires, about, uh, developing these questionnaires and making sure that the questionnaires and these tools uh, measure very precisely the thing uh, that we, we want to measure. Uh, 
uh, these questionnaires provide clinically useful information about issues that are actionable, that are both relevant to patients and, and the, the clinical uh, clinician system, cl clinicians in their care as well. Um, and so uh, this is what uh, we have been trying to look at if there are new tools that use these innovative uh, computer-based technologies to administer the relevant questions and to measure issues uh, very precisely uh, and provide useful, clinically useful and actionable information on certain aspects of health experience that is, uh, be that is fatigue or pain or, or mental health related issues. And importantly, we, we hope to use these tools in a complex system. So these tools would not be replacing the interaction, uh, but as actually it has been shown for cancer care and some other uh, chronic uh, conditions, these tools can facilitate the communication between patients and, and uh, clinicians. Uh, instead of replacing it. And so these, these measurements will bring in topics that uh, are relevant to the patients at the moment. Uh, although clinicians may not uh, ask that because we in, in the kidney transplant clinic, we are mainly focusing on kidney related issues, kidney function and, and then immunosuppression. But the, uh, actually at, this, at that particular moment when we meet the patient in the clinic, their main problem may be sleep or the anxiety and, and, and other issues that COVID brought up on them. And uh, we may not ask that because we don't think it's, it's uh, within our kind of scope of activity, but uh, this is really what determines how the patient feels. And in fact, it may determine whether they're able to remember to take their medications or not, whether they have the initiative to take their medications or not. And if they don't take their immunosuppressive medications, they might, uh, uh, get into a rejection and lose their organ. So measuring these uh, seemingly unrelated uh, uh, issues and topics that are not necessarily so important for the clinicians, but may be actually very important to, to patients, up to 30, 40% of the patients experience these issues recurrently, uh, is quite important to the overall success uh, of, of transplant, organ transplant, be that lung, uh, liver, or kidney transplant. So currently we are uh, building this, this toolkit uh, system for, for patients with all kinds of transplant, uh, whereby we select um, questionnaires and tools to measure these, uh, these uh, patient reported outcome domains, um, precisely using tools that uh, have been developed by the uh, NIH at the, in the US. And these, these tools use computer assisted technologies to administer the appropriate uh, questions and um, eventually give us the, the precise scores. Uh, we link these scores then to uh, the clinicians, but also we link these scores to self-management support resources for the patients so that uh, if uh, the issues are relatively easy to manage or if there are resources out there that help the patient and the families to manage these issues, they can find it uh, easily on, on that uh, resource hub that we are currently uh, developing and linking to the assessment tool. Great, thank you. Um, since we don't have unlimited time, we obviously aren't able to discuss all the challenges that transplant faces, but I hope this provided a glimpse into some of the very interesting and very complex problems that have yet to be solved in this field. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to turn it over to each of our panelists one last time to tell us what they see for the future of transplant medicine and research. Dr. Bad, let's start with you. I think, you know, uh, the future um, really should be devoted to improving long-term uh, outcomes and trying to achieve a lifespan that is comparable to the general population ultimately. Like we, we should really be aiming towards transplant as a cure. And uh, the whole idea of one transplant for life really is something, that vision is something we should all be working towards as a transplant community. Thank you. Dr. Kompelinka? Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, that's a, a, it's a million dollar question, you know, what does the future hold? We never know, really. But, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of promise in some of these cell-based therapies that are going to be offered either, either at the time of transplantation, uh, you know, to reduce the initial injury that the organ sustains, which is relevant to all organ transplants. Uh, probably better understanding of some of these entities like scarring, what causes scarring and so on, and uh, and um, regeneration. So this whole idea of, you know, growing kidneys uh, ex vivo or, or growing certain uh, parts, you know, that are required to, that could be then delivered and so on. Um, I think that that is probably for the longer term future what uh, what uh, what I can see as some of the potentially very promising therapies. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mucci, your, your last thoughts? Yeah, so uh, transplant is, is very exciting because it, it uh, brings together all these uh, seemingly quite diverse and different aspects of, of medicine and health from the molecular, the immunological, and the societal level. And I think uh, that's what I think uh, will be the future to see how these uh, precision uh, molecular-based um, tools can be brought back into the uh, reality of everyday everyday clinical practice, where actually the interactions are between two human beings. Wonderful. And Dr. Sapil, how about you? Your last thoughts on your and the future of transplant? Yeah, I think I think broadly speaking, uh, we we need to be able to create enough organs that everyone in needs would have one uh, without needing to wait. Um, and uh, today we restrict transplantation to a small subset of patients because we just don't have enough organs. But if we, if we, if we had a much unlimited you know, source of organs, um, then I think we'll be able to expand the use of transplantation to diseases that today we can't use it. So that's number one. And I think the second one uh, would be uh, to you know to have organs that outlive the recipient, as you know uh, 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 was uh, mentioned here too. Uh, so we 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 do the transplant, and whether that will be by generating uh, organs itself that will um, be modified so that the recipient will find as a foreign organ, or whether there will be changes in the treatment of these patients that will help these organs to outlive the recipients. I think um, both, both parts will be uh, major advances in the future. Wonderful, thank you so much. If you'd like to stay on for our next session at 7 p.m., we invite you to do so. That session is exploring a career in transplantation. Hope to see you there.
Good evening and welcome to Explore a Career in Transplantation, part two of the Ashmira Transplant Center's virtual open house. My name is Brittany Cole and I'm a post-transplant coordinator in the liver transplant program. And I also host the Living Transplant Podcast, which is the center's, the Transplant Center's podcast. I'll be moderating tonight's session along with my co-host from Living Transplant, Courtney Mart. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Brittany. And hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Mart. I'm the communication specialist for the Center for Living Organ Donation, and as Brittany said, the co-host for the podcast, Living Transplant. Um, tonight, we're joined by a very exciting group of speakers, and I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanne Z. I'm the Senior Clinical Director for the Ashmere Transplant Program. Thanks, Joanne. It's nice to see you. Cynthia, did you want to go next? Hi, uh, my name is Cynthia Tsien. Uh, I'm a liver specialist who takes care of patients before and after liver transplantation. Um, I'm also the education director, and it's my job to provide a great educational experience to all of the learners at the Ashmira Transplant Center. And um, I actually just moved here from Ottawa about two months ago, and I'm really excited to join the team. Okay, well, we're glad to have you. Um, Blaine. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Blaine Amir Syed. I'm a uh, liver transplant surgeon. I work uh, both on the uh, adult side at Toronto General Hospital, as well as uh, serving as the uh, surgical director of our pediatric liver transplant program at SickKids Hospital. Thanks, good to see you. And Catherine. Hi there, my name is Catherine Tinkham. I am a kidney transplant physician and I'm also a laboratory medicine physician um, with a, a specialty in the HLA lab, which is the lab where we determine all the organ matching. Um, and more recently, I'm actually now the physician in chief at University Health Network. And belated congratulations on that. Um, <laughs> so a big thank you to everyone for joining us uh, tonight. We're really looking forward to the conversation. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that you can submit your questions at slido.com with the event code transplant. So you can submit questions and vote them up or down to determine the order in which they are asked. So that's slido.com with the event code transplant. Um, so let's jump right in. We'll start with Brittany. Brittany, how did you end up at the Ajmera Transplant Center? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I first started off as a nurse um, when I was um, in medicine and I, about a year into that, uh, the CEO decided to change our floor. And I kind of just rolled with, with the punches that way. And was like, oh, okay. I had to be quite blunt. I had no general interest or any knowledge really on the transplant program or anything to do with transplant. They don't really get taught that in nursing school, um, unfortunately. Um, so I kind of just went with it. And um, ever since then, I'm now about almost, almost seven years into my career. And every single year since I've been in the transplant program, I've been given a new opportunity. Um, which just, just pushed me to every limit, limits that I never thought I would ever get to in my nursing career. Uh, so I kind of just, like, I think like most people, I kind of just fell into it, to be honest, um, and have never left. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for, for me, kind of similar in yeah. terms of how I came into it. I, as I say on the podcast all the time, I do not have a medical or a science background at all. Um, I have a master's in English Lit and a postgraduate certificate in public relations and corporate communications. Um, so it was through that program that I happened to get, well, happened to get, I applied for the internship at UHN at the Center for Living Organ Donation. And um, yeah, the rest is history. I definitely didn't think that as a English Lit student, I would be working at Toronto General and Transplant, but it was a happy accident. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna stick around for as long as I can. And, and what's your favorite part about the transplant program, Courtney? Oh, I think, um, I mean, as a someone who's interested in stories, I think the stories in transplant, I'm obviously super biased, but I think they are the best stories, which is what I love about the podcast so much is that we get to um, invite people to share their stories. And what I love about my job in general is I get to just share the, the happy stories from transplant. That's amazing. Um, so Cynthia, first off, congratulations on joining the liver transplant team and also taking the role as the education director for the Ajmira Transplant Center. So how did you end up in transplant and hepatology? 
So um, when I went to medicine, I actually really did not have a clear idea of where I wanted to end up. Um, I just had this general idea that I wanted to help people. And so when I went through med school, I think you just start seeing like what you're good at, what you enjoy. And what I really enjoyed was hepatology. So like the study of liver disease. Mm -hmm. And then um, as part of hepatology, you do some training and transplant. And prior, my experience had been taking care of people with very bad liver disease. So really like very end stage, very sick, like they end up in the hospital quite a bit. And then I did transplant and it was really, really gratifying because you see people getting these liver transplants and then they're completely different. Like they're completely new, different people from those people that like, you know, maybe three months ago were literally dying in the hospital. So I really enjoyed uh, that aspect of transplantation and um, I really enjoyed the research part of it, like being at a world-class institution like this, because I'm, I think I'm a little bit ADHD in that I really love doing a lot of different things. I like keeping busy. And so I have the opportunity to do clinical work and take care of patients and do some research, do education, um, have leadership roles. Like it's really never boring and working with these patients is so rewarding that I really love uh, being in this job. So you really had no clear idea, like when you graduated high school that you were going to go into hepatology. It wasn't, I had no Mm. idea at all. (laughs) I think it's especially in liver transplant. See, it's like night and day for some, once they get their transplant, you're like, wow, that's absolutely incredible. Right. And so Joanne, how, what was your path to transplant? Oh, well, when I was born. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll start from the well, very I beginning. <laughs> I, I think I was always really attracted to helping others. And so my training, my background is actually a physiotherapist. And I kind of knew I wanted to help others. You know, even when I was young, I would be the person, you know, helping someone who was in a cane or a walker across the street, knowing the lights was going to turn yellow soon. <laughs> so I think I was always attracted to that. Um, But with my physiotherapy background, I always kind of stumbled into leadership, um, similar to you, Brittany, kind of a coordinator type of role. Mm. And then I really enjoyed um, helping others grow. And I think of being in healthcare, we're always educators. So like learning and teaching. And so I fell into being a manager, which is really like a coach, right? You want to help people be the best that they can be and really work towards a common goal. And that's for helping others be better. And so um, after being a manager, I, you know, uh, went on to be a director and that was more around looking at system changes, right? So how can I make a difference, not only at the local level, but more at a systems change level. And then I went and did my master's in quality improvement and patient safety, because I wanted to really formalize, you know, the knowledge around how to make change and make change stick and be effective. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of led me um, to be, you know, a better director, but also I was a rehab director over at Toronto Rehab. And we did also some um, with our CEO, just really looking at how it's really important for our leaders to understand the entire health system. So being in rehab, I was, uh, had the opportunity to join the Ajmira Transplant Center, which you know, was actual a privilege and honor. And it's been remarkable um, working with this team and just really spearheading some of supporting the change. That's incredible. Um, So you went from, you went from, do you miss physio at all? You know what? I, I do miss the clinical piece in terms of there's very direct gratification as being a frontline clinician, right? You see the impact you're having on the patient day to day. Um, I do miss that, but I think indirectly when I can help support teams moving forward in innovation, I, I have a different impact. Yeah, definitely being in the front line is very tangible versus um, when you're working in a clinical, in a, in a director role, you get to um, help a, a broader specter, spectrum of people. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a cool way to think of it too. Just like, yeah, how to follow a career is like what kind of impact you want to make and how you want to how you want to impact people. That's that's very cool. Can you tell us a bit more about your role as clinical director just for the audience? Yeah, it's it's an operational leadership position. So um, all the clinical nurse managers report into my portfolio, but it's really looking at 
I would say my, my passion is quality and safety. So um, just enabling our teams to be able to do the work that they do best, trying to remove barriers. Um, there is a, a business component to it. So there's financial aspects, human resources, but I would say the ultimate piece is around improving our patient outcomes and experience. Awesome. Uh, so Catherine, uh, how did you get started in medicine and nephrology and was transplant always the end goal for you? You know, I, I was I was one of those, I think one of those high school students who always wanted to go to medical school, but I had no idea what I wanted to do within it. And when I started going through all my rotations, I was the one who was like, oh my gosh, I love pediatrics. Maybe I'll do that. Oh, wait a second. I love surgery. Maybe I'll do that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. OBGYN. I'm going to do that. Like I, I actually just genuinely love the practice of medicine and I found it, you know, so exciting and so wonderful that I was fully undifferentiated. Um, so I did what a lot of undifferentiated people do. And I went into internal medicine, which still gave me all of the scope of cardiology and hepatology and gastroenterology and endocrinology and all of those things. And then in internal medicine, I started being like, oh, I really like cardiology. Wait, 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 I really like endocrinology. But then when I hit nephrology, it was all, it was, you have this moment where you realize, oh my gosh, this is it. Part of it is I'm a total math nerd and nephrology is a very mathematical specialty. Um, but even within nephrology, there's so many different aspects. And I think I was just really fortunate that I had amazing mentorship who happened to um, also be involved in transplant and then I was very fortuitous, a lot of happy accidents. I got invited to go work or do some research in one of the laboratories, which turned out to be the HLA laboratory, which is where they do all the organ matching. And I got really interested in that. And I think that was really where I sort of saw the capacity to sort of merge nephrology and transplant and the laboratory. And I went on to actually, I went from, I trained in Winnipeg originally, then I went to Vancouver where I did nephrology training, then transplant, then I went to Boston, which is where I did the lab stuff. And then kind of pulled that all together into a job in Boston for a while and then got recruited back to Toronto to do both nephrology transplant and the laboratory piece, the HLA piece. Um, so it was, and it's really fantastic. Like one of the things I think that is great about transplant is you still have to be a really good generalist in order to be a transplant doc. So although you have a lot of specialty in one particular area, like in Cynthia's case, liver transplant or in mine, kidney transplant, you still have to be a really good general doctor. And I really love that part of it. I love the fact that I still, we look after all of our patients, regardless of what problem they come in with, even if it's not necessarily a transplant related problem. And I love that aspect of the clinical care. I love how broad it is, how it really allows us to be, you know, really comprehensive in our care of patients. And I really love the team. Like transplant is interesting in that I get to interact with my liver transplant colleagues and my heart transplant colleagues and our surgeons, like on a regular basis. And we have such an amazing multidisciplinary team from our ward nurses to our clinical coordinators and our nurse practitioners. It feels like this really, it really is an incredible team. And you feel like you're part of something amazing. And not only do you get to do all this very rewarding work looking after patients, you get to go to work and really enjoy hanging out with your colleagues um, because all of you are kind of focused on the same thing and you have the same motivation and the same optimism. And that is just such a fantastic way to spend every day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, that's the dream for everyone, right? Is to just love your job. So yeah. you were talking a lot about mentorship and how, how important that was to you. Um, are there any mentors that really stood out to you along, along the way? You know what? I've been super fortunate to have both great mentors and great sponsors. And I think you need both and you need to be both for other people. So mentors, you know, give you really great advice and they give you great advice in certain aspects of your career. Like the clinical aspect or the, um, or the research aspect or how to be a good teacher. And then I've also had, I've been really lucky that I've had great sponsors who are the people who, when they hear about an opportunity, they say, hey, have you thought about this person? And you get to move forward that way. And I think one of the things I love now, so I just finished um, last year doing an MBA. So you can go back to school really late and do these things. Although I have to say pulling an all nighter at this age is a lot harder. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the things I really wanna think about now that I'm in the position to do so is how do I return the favor? And how do I not only, I mean, not just give advice to people because you know, sometimes free advice is worth what you pay for it, but how do I see opportunities and look at people and say, hey, you should think about this person for this opportunity and help other people have those same connections that I've benefited from in the past. That's, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Blaine, what about you? Uh, when did you decide that you wanted to be a surgeon and how did you bring that to fruition? 
like I'm always following Dr. Tinkham, which is not <laughs> good. <laughs> every time you speak, I'm like, that's it. That's it right there. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I was actually very similar to actually what Dr. Tinkham was describing in terms of I, in medical school, really enjoyed everything that I did in every rotation that I went on. I thought I was going to be a neurologist or psychiatrist or and uh, I did an MD PhD and I had done my PhD in immunology. So before I did any of my clinical work, really, I'd already had my basic science background. And when I hit my surgical rotation, I really enjoyed it. I had a very skewed perception of what surgeons were and how they functioned. And uh, the uh, tradition that I was exposed to, actually, they were, you know, in essence, thought of themselves as internists, as medical doctors who cut. And I really like that uh, in terms of people who are really kind of very well-rounded physicians. And that really appealed to me in my sense of uh, what medicine should look like. My father's a family physician, so that always inspired me. I grew up kind of tagging along in clinic and, and rounds. Um, and so I really learned everything I know about interaction with uh, my colleagues and with patients from my dad. Um, and so surgery appealed to me. Um, it just clicked for me. In terms of transplant, it was uh, transplant to me, it was really the science that drove me there, right? Like transplant was the field where I felt like science was part and parcel. It was, you couldn't be a transplant surgeon without being interested in science. Um, and so really the science pushed me there. The other thing that I found to be very uh, motivating, and, and I've heard one of my mentors speak about this, it is in some ways a uniquely and profoundly optimistic field, right? Like our whole field starts with the idea that someone says, I'm going to do something good for somebody else. Like there is nothing that we can do as physicians and healthcare providers without someone first making an altruistic uh, uh, statement and altruistic uh, uh, intention to help somebody else. And it's such a unique field. And that really spoke to me and really inspired me. And I always just found that so profoundly moving within our field uh, that basically we wake up every day and we start our day with someone has done something good for somebody else. And that's allowed us to help another person. Um, and I uh, still to this day, uh, very much am inspired by that. Uh, when I figured out that I wanted to do transplant liver is what really interested me. Um, and I've been privileged enough to uh, take care of both adult and pediatric patients. Um, and, uh, you know, really with a, a world cross group at both uh, at UHN and at sick kids. Uh, so I feel very privileged in that regard. But everything you just said pretty much sums up why I love being able to, it's such a privilege to be able to share the stories of transplant because they're so incredible and, and life-changing. Um, you just touched on a bit how you are at Toronto General and Sick Kids. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so uh, the we have uh, obviously a, a transplant programs at both places. Um, and uh, historically, there's always been a very close coordination between the Toronto General Liver Transplant Program and the Sick Kids Liver Transplant Program, uh, in, in essence, a really kind of a hybrid program. A big part of what we do for our pediatric patients depends on our living donor program, um, and that's those living donors uh, uh, make their donations. The surgeries are, are at uh, Toronto General, um, so there's always been a close coordination of surgeons between Toronto General and Sick Kids, and so uh, I was fortunate enough to be trained by uh, Dr. David Grant uh, right before he retired. And he had always had a big footprint at both hospitals. Um, and uh, as many people said, it's better to be lucky than good. And so I just happened to be in the right place at the right time uh, to really, uh, and, and Dr. Grant helped groom me for that role. And, um, and so basically I do uh, in some small part of, of what he was doing in, in serving as both the surgical lead for the pediatric liver transplant program at, at SickKids um, and uh, being part of the liver transplant program, the live donor program at Toronto General. Cool. Yeah, this, uh, the, the transplant program is very energizing. And I honestly feel like after every single one of your stories, I feel like I can relate to almost every single one of them. Um, like, uh, Catherine, you said you wanted to, you were like, OBGYN or pediatrics. I always wanted to do something like that. And then transplant just like, eh, I was so intrigued by it. Um, so it's very clear that there's obviously not just one way to get into the transplant program. There's so many avenues that we can all run down. 
Um, so we're going to move on to our Slido for now. Did I say it right? Slido, Slido. Slido. It's Slido, Slido right? Yes. Okay. I yeah. wasn't sure. Um, and now for our live Q&A. And so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me just pull this up. So we'll just start with one of the questions I remember. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So we'll just start with this one. Um, and again, if anyone would like to submit a question or vote questions up and down, please feel free to do so using the co- uh, QR code on the slide there. Um, all right. So if you had to start your career over, what would you change? Um, so as Brittany said, there's no one way to get into transplant. Um, so if you knew this, where you were headed, I guess, is there anything you would change? Would you change anything? Um, Joanne, let's start with you. Oh, I think the right answer is I probably would have liked to start transplant earlier in my career. I think you know, our our decision around ensuring that leaders are well-rounded to fully understand the system. I think it starts off with, you know, when you think of the very, very sick and the acute, I think you get such an amazing um, understanding and appreciation of, of everything that's done. And I think Blaine said it right. Like, I wake up every morning knowing that it's starting with the generosity of someone that's given a gift a gift of life to another person. And I think that satisfaction and and that responsibility that I have as one of the leaders of the program, I get to work with amazing people. So I think starting my career over, I probably would have wanted to come to transplant earlier in my career. Right, okay. So it sounds like transplant is really where where you wanna stay. Hopefully we get to keep you. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Cynthia? Uh, No, I don't think I would make any changes. Um, I think I took a little bit of a circuitous route myself, but um, it was a great experience. Like everything that I did, um, you know, I learned from and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that you have to be laser focused. I think that everything that you do and that you learn from definitely, um, add something to the table. And as my colleagues have said, you know, transplant is so diverse and there's so many things that lead to transplant that I don't think you need to necessarily say, oh, you know, from day one, I knew that I wanted to do transplant and that's all I did all the time. I think all, all the different experiences I had and all the different things I learned have been super helpful to me um, in my role today. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I I think it's pretty rare that someone knows exactly what they want to do and they do that thing and it's exactly what they hoped and everything works out. So yeah, I, um, Blaine, Catherine, unless there's anything you want to add, I assume everyone kind of feels a similar, similar way that they, they feel well-rounded based on uh, the journey they took to transplant. Yeah, the only thing I would, it's not that I would change. I love exactly everything that I've done. One of the things Mm -hmm. that is kind of fun, but also, it's a great opportunity and also a little bit scary sometimes in medicine is you have to move around a lot or you can move around a lot for your training. And I mean, when I say move around, I don't mean like different hospitals. I mean, different cities, different countries. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I might change knowing what I know now is I would have gone to more different places as part of my training. I was fortunate to actually go to a few, but I think one of the things that I've, I've learned is because I've seen medicine practiced in so many different places already, Every time you get to see how it's practiced differently, you learn something else and you bring something even more rich to the environment and an understanding that there's not just one right way to do thing and an increased tolerance and a greater appreciation for equity and diversity. So I think the one thing I do is I try to be even a bit braver and do training in a few bit more, few more places, but I wouldn't change a single thing about what I've done otherwise. I love that. Blaine, do you have anything to add? No, I agree uh, with everybody said. Sorry, I, I have to stop. Putting you right after Catherine. <laughs> 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 I was your earlier request for that. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. So, what are the first steps? What are first steps an undergraduate student can take to get involved in the transplant center, research, shadowing programs, etc.? Cynthia, maybe you can take this one. 
Yeah, I'd love to. I'm very excited that people are interested. Um, We have a fantastic group of people who have already established these fantastic programs, so I can't take credit for that. Um, I think uh, later on, we're going to show you guys our website. Um, where you can basically find information. Uh, There's a lot of summer programs, um, workshops. um, uh, They're working on a um, education program. Um, But I think, uh, you know, it's important to know that um, there's a lot of clinicians in our department who are hiring summer students. Um, There's opportunities for mentorships, um, co-op students throughout the year. So there are a lot of opportunities to get involved in transplant now. And uh, we're going to show the website where you can find the links to all of these programs um, during the summer, but also throughout the year. Okay. Um, How about Catherine? What are some steps do you think that some yeah I don't know that I have I have you keep putting me out for Cynthia no um, (laughs) (laughs) um, so I I don't know that I have that much much to add the other thing I would also say and this is just this is more of an editorial and personal comment is that if you think you might want a career in transplant you don't necessarily have to start doing an undergrad and I think what you heard from a lot of us is we've all done lots of different things that got us to this path and I think it's equally important to follow your passion and do things that are interesting, that make you a well-rounded person. Like if I could go back to undergrad now, I would do more anthropology and maybe astronomy. But the point is like, I think you also can just do really interesting things to, you know, to be a part of your community. Um, all of those things matter when you're thinking about any career, including a career in transplant. So it is fantastic that people are excited and want to learn more. But I also don't want people to think that if they don't do these things, that a career in transplant is off the table for them. Because I think you really just have to explore your passion and be a really well-rounded person and and care deeply about wanting to help people. I completely yeah. agree. I, I was about to say that Courtney, um, Courtney's a true representation of that because she didn't start by any means going into the medicine medical field and landed in transplant with a comms degree. So it's, and she she is like, I mean, granted she's my co-host, so I speak very highly of her, but I do think Courtney is a very well-rounded person and a great person to, um, as a, as a representation of that. Thanks Brittany. (laughs) No problem. (laughs) I wasn't wasn't ready for that compliment, but um, yeah, Catherine, going back to what what you said, I think that's a really good point. Like no profession takes place in a vacuum. We all kind of need to have a a sense of the world around us. So Um, Lane, this next question is absolutely for you. (laughs) What does a typical day look like for a transplant surgeon? It's perfect. I can really stretch out with this one here. I don't have to follow. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, so one of my daughters will come into the bedroom screaming about how they don't have any clean clothes. And then, you know, the, the day will kind of go from there. I mean, I would say the, the interesting thing about transplant surgery is there's probably no typical day, um, which is one of the things that appealed to me. Um, uh, it's not, it's more organized than organized chaos, but, but it's a really different field. So unlike a lot of, uh, medical and surgical fields where you have a very distinct schedule, okay, I'm going to do, I'm operating on Mondays and Wednesdays from 10 AM to four. It's not like that you're on call. And so for instance, if I'm on call, uh, for a stretch of time uh, for a week or weekend, uh, basically I'm getting calls about potential, uh, organ offers for, uh, recipients that we have. Uh, I'm evaluating the information and making decisions about the right offers for the right recipients. Uh, I take all those very seriously. So they take a lot of thought. Uh, Every offer is a potential life saved. And so we always think about how we can best utilize these organs uh, for patients who are on the wait list. These can happen in the middle of the night, they can happen in the middle of the day. And so it's really kind of a, it it truly is a 24 seven type thing. Uh, And then after we accept offers, we get our recipients in, we see them, we talk to them about the surgery that's upcoming. And then we have the surgery itself. Our operating room days can be quite long and they can start at any hour of the day. Um, the uh, uh, operations may last anywhere from four to five hours to eight to 10 hours. Uh, I will tell you the time moves really quickly in the operating room. Uh, it's rare that you're kind of just counting the minutes. It's always interesting. It's a very kind of uh, uh, busy um, and uh, interesting um, uh, 
hands-on type experience. And then certainly the best part afterwards and really before COVID is then going out to the waiting room, talking to the family who's waiting, telling them everything has gone well, uh, seeing the relief and the joy on their faces, uh, and then rounding the following day and seeing the patients that you've been helping over the last three or four days. It's really uh, incredibly rewarding. Um, and so I'd say that would be kind of a, you know, a typical, that would be encapsulated with a typical call week, uh, but it really depends from a day-to-day perspective. Right, of course. Um, so being on call with that feeling of, you know, they could contact you at any time, how do you how do you find a work life balance knowing that you could be going into the OR at any any moment? I mean, you know, thankfully we're not on call all the time. Yeah. I think that would be a real challenge. Uh, you know, my wife will sometimes make me sleep on the couch when things are really busy <laughs> because it disrupts her sleep. And so that's a work-life balance solution. Um, the, you know, my kids actually, it's, my kids are, are pretty funny. And so they, we have four girls. Uh, my oldest is 13 and 11. Then we have twins who are eight. And I remember once when I was a resident, one of my, my twins were playing and one of them was rolling on the floor and saying, I'm coding, I'm coding. Oh and the other one was pretending to, Gosh. but it's because when I was on call as a resident, you're always getting calls, you're running, they say the patient, you know, so there's really kind of like an intense experience. My kids actually have full understanding in many ways of the uh, level of seriousness of this. And so when I get calls, my, it, I mean, you don't hear them banging on the door now, they take it really seriously. Um, and they're very invested in it. And when they see, you know, their dad uh, in a news article, or if they watch this on YouTube, they, they take, they're really proud of it. Um, and so I've tried over time, and I'm sure that uh, many of you have had the same experience. I try not to build such a wall between my professional career and my personal career. I want my kids to know when I'm not there, it's I'm not there for a reason. It's because I'm there to help somebody uh, and for them to be proud of me for that. Um, uh, it can be hard, you know, obviously uh, from our, uh, our call and clinical responsibilities. Uh, but uh, I think in the end, uh, seeing that pride in their eyes is, makes it worth it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It's um, not so much work-life balance as a healthy work-life integration. I like that. That's a, a good way of saying it. <laughs> okay. So um, I will ask this one. What is, <laughs> what is your wildest organ transplant story? And I feel like because Blaine went always following Catherine, we'll go with Catherine. You're up first. <laughs> You know, I, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not 100% certain how to answer this question. Um, I sort of feel like, you know, these stories are, are very you know, unique and very personal to patients and to donor families. Um, and it's not so much that the stories are wild or exciting. I think it's that, you know, I think we've done some incredible things at UHN. So um, this might not meet the definition of what people are talking about wildest, but one of the things that I think UHN's had a lot of transplant firsts, and maybe that's some of the things that we could focus on. So thinking a little bit, some people may be aware of the kidney paired donation program in Canada, which is uh, quite a phenomenal program where if people have a donor, a living donor for a kidney that they don't, um, that they that they're not a match to, um, there's actually kind of a, a matching program across the entire country where donors from a donor from Vancouver could give a kidney to someone here in Toronto and their donor could give to someone in Halifax and their donor can give to someone in Saskatoon and so on. And, and what, what people may not realize is the very first one of those transplants that ever occurred happened right here at TGH in 2008, I think February, 2008. Um, and actually when we were actually able to create that very first chain through you know, looking at people's matching profiles. And I actually did the matching using post-it notes on a whiteboard in my office. So I don't know if that's a wild transplant story, but it's still kind of a cool transplant story. And it's sort of the start of how kidney paired donation, that was the very first one of those that we did in Canada. Um, and so when I think about wild organ transplant stories, what I really think about is a lot of the firsts that have happened here. The first lung transplant was ever done, was done in the world, the successful one, it was done here at UHN. We just finished, I should, I'm gonna take Cynthia's line here, but the thousandth living donor liver transplant was just done here at UHN. These are amazing firsts and really, I think they're wild. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I like to celebrate. Um, maybe not anything as dramatic as you might see on Gray's Anatomy, but really, really <laughs> remarkable. And I, I think to Blaine's point, highlighting the uh, incredible generosity of donors and donor families 
And honestly, the um, really emphasizing the trust that our, our patients place in us, which I think is the biggest honor. Um, I think that was a perfect answer for that question. Um, speaking of world first, we did an episode on the transplant podcast with Dr. Levy, and he talks about all of yeah. the world first that we did at Toronto General, because um, they are absolutely wild. Um, and you mentioned the paired kidney donation program. And I remember Dr. Cole had mentioned that you were also a big advocate for the, um, Courtney, the, help me out here. The vouchers? The yes, voucher the system? voucher system. Yeah, so I, I, I'll be candid. I don't like the term voucher. It sounds far too transactional. Sure. Um, so <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of, um, I think there's just a lot of ways that we now are able to match donors and recipients um, that, that we wouldn't even thought of like 10 or 15 years ago. And so the way I would think about what I think in some parts, like some programs they call a voucher program, I would think about as asynchronous live donation where someone is able to donate a kidney to sort of the, the living donor paired exchange pool well in advance of when their intended recipient might actually need that transplant. And the reasons people might want to do that is they might be healthy enough to donate right now. And they're worried that if they're either their family member or their friend who might need a transplant might not need that transplant for 10 or 15 years, that person might not be eligible to donate then. So the whole idea is how do we start to create asynchronous opportunities to ensure that we still increase living donation and we are able to meet people's desires to donate when it's appropriate for them. This is something right now that is not yet operationalized in Canada. There's a lot of government policy and provincial policy that needs to be managed to do that. But it's not really about either a voucher system or, or those type of things. It's about how do we continuously look at how we do things and ask if we can do things better from a very patient and donor centric approach, maintaining our principles of quality and safety and good outcomes, but really reflect the creativity that we can achieve with the changing times. Yeah, and yeah. working at um, with so many world first at UHN, that really is the, the mindset, Catherine, that you just illustrated is that like, how can we how can we increase? How can we make it better? How can we make it smoother? Um, that's one of the great things I think about working in the transplant center, for sure. Yeah. Does anyone want to add on with wild or groundbreaking organ transplant stories? I think that uh, Catherine summed it up well, but when I look at the, the profile of anyone joining the transplant team, it's one of curiosity, mm -hmm. one who always wants to improve the next step. And I think courage, when you think of, you know, how do you start a paired exchange program? How do you do the first islet transplant, um, you know, preemptive kidney transplant to prevent ongoing chronic dialysis? You think of all of those world first, like we have ex vivo lung, taking a lung and, you know, it's living outside the, the body before we implant it. All of that is about courage, innovation, and just trying to keep improving what we do every day. So, I mean, I think that's why it's so exciting to work in transplant. Surely the most, the, I, I, I always, whenever you talk about, we talk about the world's first a transplant program. I honestly always feel just like really energized. And I'm like, I just can't wait to go to work tomorrow because I, <laughs> I love talking about it. Um, if Gary, Dr. Levy did the, talked about how he started the program, which was always, which is a very interesting story. Um, so I guess that hope that answers the wildest organ transplant story question. Can I piggyback actually off of both Absolutely. Catherine and Joanne's comments? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think one of the other things that's interesting is that, you know, from a programmatic standpoint in terms of the innovation and the courage and the, the kind of first in Canada, first in the world that we have, there's an interesting translation on an individual patient physician relationship. And so I'll tell a story about a uh, young uh, man that I transplanted that uh, Catherine helped me with quite a bit, who uh, got a liver transplant. Uh, and uh, he's father of, of two kids, the uh, youngest, uh, less than 10 years old. Uh, and he needed the transplant. He got the transplant. Everything was going great. He looked great. He's walking around. And then his liver just started failing and we didn't understand what was happening and it failed mm -hmm. really quickly. And I think, you know, it's hard to 
exactly put into words the relationships that we as healthcare providers, as physicians, as nurses have with our patients in a one-on-one, but you feel so personally invested. And I was beside myself watching this happen uh, because I had done his first transplant. And I came back on call when we had relisted him uh, within a week or so for a new liver. And I came and I had an offer that wasn't a perfectly match organ, but it was a good organ. I came to Catherine and I said, I want to put this liver into this gentleman because it's his only shot. We really work through the risks and the benefits and what we were going to have to do for him to really optimize, to make things work for him. And we did it. And part of that is because we have a history of innovation and understanding what that means, how to manage those situations clinically and people being brave and courageous and doing things and pushing the envelope for our patients he did great afterwards and he uh, he's on Twitter all the time. And, and it's really, every time I see his face pop up, it makes me smile and sometimes gives me goosebumps and, you know, on, and so certainly from a programmatic standpoint, it's really amazing, but also on a one-to-one individual physician level, individual nurse uh, to their uh, patient in the, the culture of innovation and pushing things uh, in uh, really difficult times and patients who are in dire straits, it's really uh, I- inspiring and, and really um, uh, it really cements this relationship with patients uh, that I think is hard to, to really put into words sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, almost a, well, I think you kind of answered this next question here. <laughs> Um, like obviously as you, as you illustrated just by that story, and I know who you're talking about. I see him all the time on Twitter too. Um, I hope he's watching, um, but, uh, yeah, so the transplant is a very gratifying experience. We hear that a lot too, from, from living donors as well, that there are kind of emotional benefits of, of helping someone by being their living donor. Um, yeah, if there's anything anyone wants to add in terms of rewarding aspects of their job, Cynthia, I know you're new and you kind of illustrated a little bit earlier about what you like about um, hepatology and and seeing the night and day difference with patients. Is is there anything you wanted to add on there? Yeah, um, I would say that actually um, echoing what Catherine said is that I've had the benefit of a lot of great mentors uh, during my career as well. And that's actually a really great part of the job is um, working with learners. And so for you know, young people who are super enthusiastic, who uh, really want to be there. Um, I feel like it's extremely rewarding to, you know, pass on that knowledge and that, you know, um, what I learned from my mentors, passing that on to another generation and Mm -hmm. seeing them develop and, you know, know that you like, you know, what you've accomplished and what you achieved, like you can pass on to this next generation that's going to build on it and keep growing. I think that's also extremely gratifying. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we have such a, um, uh, uh, as a teaching hospital, like that's such a huge part of, of what we do. Absolutely. Um, can, I, can I add one thing? Because Blaine yes. just reminded me of something. So um, it, it was actually related to that case, but it, I think it's really, it is really critical is our, our, the transplant team here at UHN is really something quite phenomenal. Um, even though you know we're not always officially on call all the time, there is not a single person who, if you text them at two in the morning on a Saturday saying, I've got a difficult case, I need your perspective on this, or I need your lens on this, that they're not going to call you back. And everyone actually just helps each other with the, and a lot of us have become very subspecialized in, very, in a lot of areas where we develop a particular expertise in you know, there could be surgical experts and there could be certain types of immunology experts and certain types of medical experts. But I think what's really amazing and why I think our patients get such great care is there's no ego in it. It's not like I have to know everything for my patient. I've got this entire team. I'm surrounded by like all these geniuses. And if I have a question, I can just call one of them or I can just walk down to their office. Well, back before COVID, I could just walk over to their office and just say like, can I discuss a case with you? Or what would you do here? And what's remarkable is how everyone is genuinely invested in the success of every patient, even if they're, a, as a kidney physician, like I'm genuinely invested in the success of Blaine's patient. And I think that is, that's actually really rewarding because it means you're part of something bigger than yourself and there's nothing more um, gratifying, I think, than that. I would have to agree. Um, in this new role as a 
coordinator. Um, a lot of people told me that working with the liver transplant team, especially the nurse coordinators, that it, they were like, oh, you're going to absolutely love it. The team is amazing. That was the very first things out of their mouth. And I'd have to agree, um, even to the, to the point of today, I had a patient um, and we often will often ask each other from across the cubicle, like, hey, Rox, what's this? Or hey, Jeff, what's this mean? Um, and we all just chime in. And it's it's not, although it is my patient, it's 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 a team effort because I don't know everything and they don't know everything, but they're all so, 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 so smart and so specialized. And it's incredible because I'm like, I don't know why, what I would do with, without you, Cynthia, I think you're laughing because maybe you've walked in and heard me be like, Shauna, um, can you help me please? <laughs> please help me with this one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I've done ab- that too. Yeah. It's especially like with otter in our system is like, it's hard to a learning curve, but um, the team has been absolutely incredible in being able to help carry each other through this whole thing. Um, um, so we yeah. have a, sorry to interrupt Brittany. We have a young transplant enthusiast. Hi, okay. Caleb. Um, uh, does anyone want to tackle this question? Does a transplant hurt? Blaine. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah, Jake Blaine. <laughs> Hi, Caleb. I'm glad you're watching. Nice to meet you. Um, so I would say yes and no. Uh, the Depending on what kind of transplant you have, we have to make an incision to put the new organ in. And that incision is usually sore after the transplant. Uh, but uh, both at Sick Kids and Toronto General, we have really awesome uh, doctors who really specialize just in helping people's pain afterwards. And so I would say routinely, uh, for, uh, my patients who, uh, are kids, uh, after a transplant, they're really feeling better a couple days after surgery. Uh, and most of them are kind of up and about, um, without too much pain. So it's usually sore the first couple of days. Uh, but after that, uh, it goes uh, back to normal pretty quickly. And there's a really great team of doctors and nurses who are really experts in helping you uh, with uh, any of the soreness afterwards and kind of getting you back on your feet. Thank you. And uh, maybe if I could interject, um, you know, a lot of our patients, when you see them after their operations in the hospital, you know that they just had a big operation, a big surgery, but they look so happy. So (laughs) I think there's definitely, um, you know, afterwards, they are just really, really happy that uh, they had the surgery. And so I think that helps quite a bit. Absolutely. That's an important detail. And they've got their energy back and they're ready to go out and play. (laughs) Um, So I guess the next question would be, uh, what is the hardest thing about working in transplant? Joanne. (laughs) You're up. <laughs> oh, I, I think when I look at, um, you know, transplant, it is reliant on a gift. And I think about every day, you know, the patients that are waiting on our wait list uh, for a transplant, for an organ, for a match. I, I think about I think about that a lot every day. And what can we do to help promote people to, you know, donate, think about donation and really um, help us boost that. So I think that's for me the hardest piece around, you know, knowing that we do have many patients waiting for an organ match and a transplant. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Catherine, how about you? Um, so you know, I think I think I think Blaine's comment about every single day starts with something really optimistic that someone has done something really positive for someone else. We certainly have a number of living donors in our kidney and our liver program, but we also have a number of deceased donors. And these are these are individuals who um, are have 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 passed away due to the course of an accident or an illness, and their families have made this incredibly generous decision to donate their organs to try to save someone to save someone else's life. And you know, we like as Blaine said, it can be in the middle of the night or any time during the day. We'll get these offers. And, and we, we learn a little bit, just, just what we need to know, medically necessary. We know, learn people's ages and a little bit about their past medical history and what illnesses they might have had. And we get to see their lab results. Um, and through that, we sort of get to know just a little bit of a glimpse about this individual whose family is making this incredibly generous gift. And what I, what I find is I, I really take some time to reflect on what that family must be going through. And I, I'm so incredibly admiring of the grace 
that they are demonstrating in what can only be some of the most painful moments of their lives. And so as I think about that, I'm incredibly grateful for my patients who are going to be getting this gift and are going to be coming well, but it is impossible to do that without having a moment of pause about the sadness that another family is feeling. And we hope that through knowing that they're helping other people and many of our recipients choose to write letters, anonymous letters to the donor family, I hope they find some peace in that. But I would be lying if I said I, I didn't have pause every time uh, thinking about this person and this life um, and what, it, what their families might be going through as well and how to balance that. And the joy that comes from, you know, seeing our patients be healthy is really wonderful. But I, I, I think we're all human and we recognize um, that balance that happens in the process. And I think we have to be mindful and really respectful of it. And I'm, I'm incredibly admiring of the grace. Yeah, uh, Cynthia, how about you? What do you think is the hardest thing? Yeah, I would have to say um, it's the fact that as other people have mentioned, like we are, I think everybody in transplant goes into transplant wanting to help other people. And um, when you can't help everyone, I think that's the hardest thing in transplant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blaine, um, you probably have a very interesting perspective with sick kids and, um, and working at Toronto General. What do you think is the hardest thing? I mean, I think, you know, Catherine and Cynthia and Joanne have all touched on really, I mean, transplant is in essence, a very different and unique field. Uh, and uh, there's a, a great book that's recently written by a, a transplant surgeon, but, you know, called when death becomes life. And that's in essence what transplant is. And so there's all, there's no joy without sorrow, certainly from a deceased donor perspective. I think the hard thing about, honestly, about medicine in general is we don't always win. Like we don't, we're not always successful. We've all lost patients despite our very best efforts. And uh, despite, you know, uh, trying as hard as we can, and it's hard and it takes, I think, a personal toll on all of us. I think certainly in the last year, year and a half, we have certainly seen with our colleagues dealing with this pandemic, how hard it can be in general, uh, uh, taking care of uh, patients uh, and really trying to help people under duress. And certainly in transplant, it's no different in that it doesn't always work. Um, and uh, in some ways, our success is our worst enemy. Transplant is, you know, really, if you think, for instance, you think about liver transplant 30 years ago, it was, I mean, uh, if, just from a brief standpoint, uh, Tom Starles was one of the surgeons who really started liver transplant. Mm -hmm. His first three patients were all children and they all died. Like two of them died on the table. One of them died immediately afterwards, right? Mm -hmm the fortitude it took for that group of anesthetists and surgeons and intensivists to keep on, right. you know, in the face of basically abject failure to now, you know, where we have, you know, uh, you know, one year survival rates for patients and recipients of 97%, right? Like, <laughs> so we become in some ways, we, we forget sometimes that things can go wrong. We can't always save patients. We can't always get organs for patients. And I think that's the hardest thing is because we all invest in our patients and we all care very deeply and we want to succeed 100% of the time. It's always hard to feel uh, like you've had a patient who uh, hasn't made it despite your best efforts. Um, and so I, I never actually, I, and I hope that never gets easier, to be quite frank. I don't want that ever to, uh, to become any easier. I want that always to sting. And because I think that's what pushes uh, all of us to do our very best for our patients and, and uh, uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, do the best we can every day for them. It was incredibly well said. Um, I'd have to agree. We all have those patients that we do lose and it makes a, it makes lights, it lights a little bit of a fire under and uh, makes you keep going. Um, with all of that being said, I think we are coming up to our end of our time. So before we wrap up, I'd like to give Cynthia a chance to share any upcoming opportunities for any students. Yes. Um, so because I, I, I do see there are some questions about like how people can get involved. So we're going to put up um, a website um, 
uh, up there, uh, where you can find um, programs for pretty much every level of learner. So we have programs aimed at um, students in high school. We have a diversity and transplant outreach program. Um, we have some opportunities for people who are an undergrad in um, medical school, um, residency. So we do have information there about the fellowships that we offer, um, the transplant research summer program. Um, and also it's, it's important not to forget, um, there's going to be information there for transplant nursing education, um, as well as mentoring and outreach. Um, and so I uh, highly encourage you um, to check out the website because there's a lot of opportunities. As I mentioned, you know, a lot of our researchers hire summer students, um, and so there's a lot of um, opportunities on the website. I highly encourage you to, to go there and, and look for all these opportunities and programs that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Cynthia. And um, if anyone has, there were unfortunately quite a few questions we didn't get to, but if you ha would like that, those questions answered, you can um, email transplant.education at uhn.ca. Um, and yeah, uh, so yeah, we're coming up on time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Really appreciate this great conversation. Thank you to our fantastic speakers. Uh, if you'd like to stay up to date on the latest in transplant, you can follow us at Give Life UHN and at UHN Transplants um, on all the usual suspects, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And uh, just a reminder that Brittany and I host a podcast called Living Transplant. And uh, that takes you behind the scenes of the Ejmera Transplant Center, and that's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, so if you're interested in future events, also check out givelifeuhn.eventbrite.ca. And yeah, we hope to see you next time. Thanks for joining us.